Well, if it's okay with you all, I want to start with saying something that is outrageous. Uh, maybe one of the most outrageous things I've ever said in my life. Maybe one of the most outrageous things you will ever hear. Ready? God justifies the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. That's outrageous, at least on the, on the face of it. How is it that the all-knowing, law-giving judge of all could justify ungodly people? God justifies the ungodly? You know, growing up, I, we watched Scooby-Doo. Anybody watch Scooby-Doo growing up? Right? And Scooby-Doo would do that, hmm? <laughs> kind of thing. Like the Scooby-Doo moment, like what in the world? Well, it's time for a little theological Scooby-Doo moment. <laughs> God justifies the ungodly? I mean, that, that's outrageous because on the face of it, that just can't be. It's, it's, it would be absolutely impossible on the face of it for God to judge, or excuse me, to justify the ungodly. Is God irrational? Is God unjust? As I mentioned last night, does God take bribes? God justifies the, he declares godly those who are ungodly. He declares righteous those who are not righteous. Is God confused? On the face of it, it's scandalous and outrageous, and I want you to feel the outrage of it all, at least at first, because it'll help us to better understand Christianity. It'll help us to better understand God. It'll help us to better understand the perfect work of Christ. It'll help us to better understand why we should praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter four, verse five. That's the text I'd like to draw your attention to, at least for this session to begin with. We're talking about justification. We're talking about God declaring us righteous. Romans four, five. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We're going to talk about what this means. We're going to talk about the ins and outs of justification. And so my outline will be, I have 12 distinctives of the biblical doctrine of justification. And that's what we're going to talk about in this session. There will be a dozen of these distinctives and you'll notice there's overlap, and that's by design. These things are all related, whether it be the righteousness of God and what it means to be righteous in his eyes, whether it be the active and passive obedience of Christ, now justification. And then in the next session, we'll do Romans chapter 8, which is related to justification and all the other things, but has to do with assurance. So I hope you're refreshed. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're better equipped to be a Christian that honors the Lord Jesus. I do have a confession to make. Uh, I've been accused, and I will affirm uh, that I stand before you as a pastor who is forenzocentric. That's a mouthful. Uh, my, I said it might look good on a T-shirt, and you have to be careful what you say, especially at the church where I pastor, because guess what? Guess what was sent to me the next week? A, a shirt that said forenzocentric. So, uh, <laughs> law-centered, legal-centered. Right? Because we've been talking about righteousness, and that would be adherence to God's law. That's forensic. We're talking about legal, and we're talking about justification. It's God declaring you a law keeper, even though you're not one. That's forensic. And I believe in justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And I think it's really, really important with the reformers and with the apostles and with the Lord Jesus. And so I count it, even though it was an insult leveled at me, uh, I count it as an insult that's actually a badge of honor. Um, I hope you become, if you're not already, forenzocentric as well. You're for justice. You're just thankful that your salvation is not dependent upon the kind of justice that would have you doing what's right. It's dependent upon a different kind of justice, the justice secured for us or the obligation met for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, distinctive. Uh, the first distinctive I want to draw your attention to would be this. Justification is what we need. Justification is what sinners need. It's what we need. 
We know this because if you just turn over one page or to the next chapter in your Bible from Romans 4, 5 to Romans 5, 1, we know we need justification. We need justification because that text says, Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need justification by faith in Christ so that we can have peace with God. Because apart from justification, we don't have peace with God. And that means we have conflict with God. That means even according to Romans chapter 5, verse 10, we're otherwise, anybody know, what? how does Romans 5, 10 describe us apart from Christ? It starts with an E. We're God's enemies. So apart from Christ, we are God's enemies. So we don't have peace. We have conflict. We have enmity between ourselves and God. We need peace. And the only way to have peace with God, according to Romans 5.1, would be for us to be justified. It is the solution to our problem. We don't want enmity or hostility. We don't want, don't want to be enemy status. We want to be at peace with God. It means we need justification. Next distinctive. The next one here regarding justification, and this one's a mouthful, I know. I'm sorry, not sorry, okay? Justification is, here's our definition. Justification is the legal declaration that one is perfectly righteous or obedient to God's law. Justification is the legal declaration that one is perfectly righteous or perfectly obedient to God's law. Justification is not, and I'm not trying to insult you if you've been a faithful Sunday school teacher over the years. I'm just going to try to help you. And I've said it this way before myself, and now I've changed, and I'm going to encourage you to change. Justification does not mean just as if I never sinned. It's not what justification is. I realize it's easy to, to remember it that way. I realize that we may have taught it that way. Um, but this is a recovery group for Protestants okay? <laughs> who, who, who want to be biblically informed and to be more faithful Christians in understanding. Justification is not just as if I never sinned. Again, that would take us to zero. Justification is just as if I never sinned and just as if I always personally, perfectly, perpetually obeyed the law of God. That won't fly in a classroom. But you get the idea. It's, it, it, bo both are necessary. Again, going back to the definition I gave, justification is, is legal, think courtroom, but it's God declaring you to be righteous even though you're not righteous, going back to Romans 4, 5. He's declaring you to be a law keeper even though you're a law breaker. So just as if I never sinned and just as if I always obeyed is what it is, okay? Please always remember that. It's, it's great to be forgiven. It's great to be treated just as if you never sinned. But it's also important because God requires more than zero, as we've been talking about, just as if I always, just as if I fulfilled the law, just as if I had loved God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved my neighbor as myself. That's what this is about. This is just classic, traditional, historic, reformed Protestantism. And it's forensic too. It's not, the justification is not when God makes us righteous. I realize in Romans chapter 5, he uses, in the ESV, he uses the make uh, word, but it's made righteous in that sense before, before the eyes of God, in the courtroom of God, as God sees things. But to be, strictly speaking, theologically speaking, when we step back and look at the passages, Protestants have not described justification as making us righteous. That, that's more in a sanctification category. That's transformation. It's true, God makes us righteous. He changes us. He transforms us. But justification is where God declares you righteous because justification is where you're still ungodly. Romans 4, 5. Does that make sense? I realize it sound, might sound nitpicky, but it's actually really important because if justification is being made righteous, but I'm not altogether made righteous yet, I'm going to be confused. God justifies the ungodly. Oh, that's a declaration. That's forensic. Just as if I never sinned and just as if I'd always done everything perfectly right, that's what justification is. 
Next one, next distinctive, we're doing 12 of these. And that would be justification for sinners is seemingly, on the face of it, impossible. And this kind of goes back to my introduction where I was trying to be provocative in saying this is outrageous. But I want you to think of this so you appreciate it in the long run is at least on the face of it, this, this can't be. If God knows everything, and he knows that I'm not righteous altogether, perfectly, it's impossible for him to declare me righteous because that wouldn't be right. I want you to think in those terms. I want to think in those terms because it's, it's, it's mind-blowing, and it begs the question, how could this possibly be? How could God declare me righteous when I'm not righteous? Is it legal fiction? I mean, surely there's an answer to this question. But in, in, in teasing it out like that and, and saying this, this seems so scandalous and outrageous, I think it puts us on the right path to seeing the glory and grandeur and the, the staggering greatness of God's sovereign grace and the great work of Christ. To, to repeat verses we've looked at, you could just jot them down if you'd like, but Romans 3.10, none righteous, no, not one. Couple Romans 3.10, none righteous, no, not one. With Romans 4.5, he justifies the ungodly. What in the world? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and yet he justifies us? 1 John 3.4 says sin is lawlessness. We've all sinned. That means we're all lawless. And God is going to look at you, a lawless sinner, and say, Jeff Gonzalez, I'll pick on him because I want to make friends with the rest of you guys. <laughs> Jeff Gonzalez, whose heart I know, and it's desperately wicked on his best day. Right? None righteous, no, not one. I declare him a perfect upholder of my law. That's seemingly impossible. How, how could that ever possibly be? Remember Romans 2.13? It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So, so think in terms of not only are you tried in a court of law for a heinous crime. Some, I don't even want to go there, but some, you're, you're, you're arrested, you're tried, the evidence is in and the, the evidence is daunting, objectively speaking, and you are found guilty. And then the judge says, not only are you not guilty in this made-up courtroom I'm using, but you're an exemplary citizen. You not only didn't commit the crime that you actually did, is the declaration, but you're a perfect, outstanding, exemplary citizen. That's all kinds of wrong, right? Unless. We're not going there yet, but there needs to be an unless. Ju justification on the face of it should be seemingly impossible unless there's more to the story. How can Romans 4 or 5 be true? unless there's more to the story. I think the Im apparent impossibility is important because it pushes us to see Jesus for the profound Savior that he is. Next, distinctive, number four, justification for sinners is a reality because of Jesus. And it's a reality because of Jesus' imputation, his crediting. Back to the illustration I used. If you weren't here in the last session, this will be confusing. Sorry, not sorry. So we've got justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That's the top. That can be true. Otherwise, it wouldn't be true if God's a just judge. But it can be true because there's real obedience, real righteousness credited, real righteousness imputed. So it's not legal fiction. There's actually something real. And this is a bit of review. Or last time I was giving you preview, if you will. Romans 4, 5 is our text again, our touchstone text to come back, back to. If you'd go there again with me, you'll see it. So 
chapter 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, talking about justification, and now we have imputation. 4, 5 says, And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, in the context, it's not just faith, it's faith in Christ, his faith is counted. There's our word sometimes translated credited. There's our word that's imputed, is counted as righteousness. Reckoned, sometimes older writers would say. So it's real, it's genuine, it's earnest, because there really is a righteousness. There really is an obedience. And the real obedience of Christ, we talked about in the last session, is credited to your account. It's given to you. So you, maybe the illustration is you were in the red when it comes to your spiritual bank account. Okay, and, and, and now that the debts are, you know, the guilt is taken care of, but you're not at zero, there's real positive law-keeping obedience now in your account, which provides the basis for God to declare you righteous because there really is righteousness, it's just not yours. So this, this is good. You can fault Christianity for a lot of things, like its adherence, <laughs> okay. but you can't fault it for being illogical. This actually, this actually is very logical. This actually makes this, I'm not asking you to take this on faith. I'm actually, actually asking you to base the biblical argument on reason. This is reasonable. It's not legal fiction. It's absolutely reasonable. Romans 4.9, since you're in the, in the zip code uh, from Romans 4.5, Romans 4.9, something similar is the blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith, I, I keep saying it's in the context, faith in Christ was counted, reckoned, imputed to Abraham as righteousness. It wasn't that he was righteous, but there is real righteousness credited to him by faith. Romans 4.22 as well. That is why his faith was counted, credited, reckoned, imputed to him as righteousness. It's all over here, and that's the point, that it's logical, that it's true, it's there. All of this assumes the right object of faith. All of this assumes that the right object of faith is none other than Jesus. So what's seemingly impossible is now certain because of a Savior. Jesus is better than I even realized. Charles Haddon Spurgeon would say, true justification by faith is the surface soil. So he's using a different illustration than I'm using, but it's kind of like it. Justification by faith is the surface soil, but then imputed righteousness is the granite rock which lies beneath it. And if you dig down through the great truth of a sinner's being justified by faith in Christ, you must inevitably come to the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ as the basis and foundation on which that simple doctrine rests. What lies beneath is actually really important, and it's not frightening, it's glorious. The real work of Jesus. There's a real basis for justifying sinners, and it's the work of another. More about this in just a bit. Real righteousness. Number five, we're doing 12 of these distinctives about justification. Number five, justification for sinners via imputation is due to his obedience. This is review from what I mentioned at the end of the last one but I really want you to get it. I really want you to get it. This is righteous. And you're experts by now because of last night, but righteousness is not this kind of phantom concept idea that we can't define, but it's used all over the Bible. And when you ask Christians what it is, they can't explain it. They just give you other Bible words. Righteousness has to do with, you know, Obeying God's law. Obeying God's law. So, this fifth distinctive, justification for sinners via imputation, is due to Christ's obedience. I'll do it one more time at least. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, based upon imputed righteousness. So God declares something to be true because there's real truth to it. But that's also based upon the righteousness comes from somewhere, and it's not this ethereal kind of, we don't really know what it is. It's obedience to God's law. It all is logical. It all makes sense. And I know lots and lots and lots of Christians 
I actually know and have met at least plenty of pastors who don't understand this. I, I'm, I'm here as a recruiter, okay? I'm enlisting men and women and boys and girls on the, on the Forenzo-centric team, okay? I don't have t-shirts for you, but you get the idea. Because you, you can be a better neighbor. You can be a, a better evangelist. You can help Christians to understand the height and depth and breadth and grandeur of this glorious gospel reality of justification by knowing some basic things. Obedience of Christ and his perfect obedience would be righteousness credited to us, imputed to us by faith so that God can then freely justify us even though Romans 4, 5 says we're ungodly. This is the kind of stuff that changes the world to help people understand this. It is good, it is great, it is magnificent, and I hope it's something you're catching on to unless you already knew it before. Jesus Christ is the one who did this. John chapter, uh, we'll move on in just a second, but uh, Matthew chapter three, verse 15, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Jesus obeyed on behalf of everyone who would ever believe, even in being baptized, a baptism of repentance. He didn't need to repent but he's acting on behalf of the people as a substitute, doing the right thing that he didn't, he he needed needed to do nothing associated with repentance, but he's acting on behalf of the people because he's the representative doing the right thing of obeying God's command to repent so that this could be true, so that this could be true, so that this could be true. And we could go passage after passage after passage. It's not a righteousness of my own, and on and on it could go. Number six, another distinctive. We're going to do a dozen of these. I better talk faster. Justification, sola fide, by faith alone or through faith alone, is not legal fiction. It's not legal fiction. Talked about this in the last session, so I can do this one super fast. The accusation by Rome, which is a good accusation, until we look closer, is that Protestants say God justifies the ungodly And how could that possibly be? Because God is a just judge. It's not legal fiction because there are things that uphold it. His obedience and therefore his righteousness. Number seven, another distinctive of the biblical doctrine of justification. Justification is in fact sola fide. It is in fact sola fide. What we mean by that is by faith. It's only by faith. It is by faith alone. And if you don't think it's by faith alone, a great text to go to is that Romans 4 or 5 text. He justifies what kind of people? The ungodly. So justification has, has to be by faith alone. It has to be by faith alone because he justifies the ungodly. So lots of people think even some professing Christians, that somehow God justifies people who are good enough and try to fulfill the commandments and try to obey God and keep the Ten Commandments and they're good, always they're bad. So don't forget Romans 4 or 5. It's one of our go-to texts. God justifies the ungodly. And if that's true, what is the one and only way to ever be justified if you're ungodly? What's the one, How about this? What's the one and only way that Pat Abendroth could be righteous in the eyes of God? What's the one and only way that I could be sure that God would declare me a law keeper? It's got to be by faith alone in somebody else. It has to be. Somehow, most religions of the world, even some that pose as Christian, Christian, God justifies the godly. God justifies somehow the people who are on the right track. God justifies the people who are trying to have their good outweigh their bad. God justifies the people who love God and love neighbor. No, God justifies the ungodly. So it demands that justification be sola fide, faith alone in Christ alone, the one and only one who is godly. I go back, I I probably go to Romans 4 or 5 more than any other text when it comes to apologetics, when it comes to talking to different people to understand the gospel, because we've not dealt with the gravity of how could God justify us when we're ungodly? Only if there's another one. 
I keep coming back to this because it's kryptonite for works righteousness. It's kryptonite for Romanism. He doesn't justify the people who go to mass enough. He doesn't go to he, he doesn't justify the people who give enough or make sure they have their relatives praying for them. He justifies people who are ungodly. Wow, how could this be? There's a perfect substitute, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's amazing. I love it. Number eight, another distinctive justification through faith alone, sola fide, is a vital gospel doctrine. It most certainly is a vital gospel doctrine. The attention given to it in the book of Romans, which is a book about the gospel, is staggering. But it's not just in Romans. Just one text and then we'll move on. I mean, when you go to Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, to get this wrong, the Apostle Paul says, is to be damned. It's to be anathema. So it's important that we grapple with this matter. In Galatians, is the controversy over the deity of Christ? Nope. Is the controversy over the humanity of Christ? Nope. Is the controversy over whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead? Nope. Is the controversy whether or not Jesus died a sinner's death, even though he wasn't a sinner? No. But that's not the controversy. The controversy in Galatians is not over supernaturalism. It's not over the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, even on the face of it. The controversy is over how is it that you, as a sinner, receive the benefits of Christ? Is it by faith and what you do? Is it, by, is it justification by faithfulness? By the way, faithfulness is good, but it's not how justification works because God justifies the ungodly, not the faithful. The big controversy is, is justification by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. That's what's going on in Galatians. So this is a gospel issue. We must have perfect obedience from Christ, the law keeper, the one who makes atonement for law breaking as well. We must have his perfect righteousness credited to us. And the one and only way to receive it is by trusting in him. By the way, faith means, belief and faith, same word translated, just two different ways. So faith, belief, trust is another synonym that's used. Rest is another synonym that's used. Faith ought not be defined in this sense as a virtue because that would mean you're godly. Now, don't get me wrong, as a Christian, you trust the Lord more and more. and You could say that's a virtue. Uh, faithfulness is good as a Christian. Um, to believe in Jesus is good and right, so you could say it's virtuous in that sense. But I just want to press the point home. Paul is saying he justifies the ungodly by faith. It's the empty hand. It, 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 it's, it's the resting and receiving. It's, it's, it's why these things are so important because it's a gospel issue. I think it is actually Machen in his Christianity and Liberalism book that does a really nice job with the Galatians issue. It, it, they're not atheists, that's not the problem. It's not that they don't believe in Jesus. It's not that they don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe that justification is by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Don't take my word for it, study these things but they're actually important things. Okay, number nine, next distinctive of the biblical doctrine of justification is that the justification is not initial and final. Justification is not initial and final. And the reason I bring it up is because some people would teach that you're initially justified by faith, and then as long as you're obedient enough, you'll be finally justified by your works. So that's what someone like N.T. Wright, Tom Wright teaches. Uh, the new perspectives on Paul. Um, so N.T. Wright is a, an Anglican bishop who is considered conservative as an Anglican because he believes in the resurrection. But 
N.T. Wright is known for teaching that justification is an initial thing, and then if you're obedient enough, you'll finally be justified by your works. Welcome to Roman Catholicism. Welcome to semi-Pelagianism, under a different name, is what I would say. So he promotes this, and he's popular because he's popular. He's a great debater, as a matter of fact. He said some true things, but it's final justification by works. Richard Baxter would be another one. Did I mention Richard Baxter in the last session? He would be another one that would teach this kind of thing, the one that John Owen fought against so vehemently. Um, another interesting person in that regard who fought against Baxter would be somebody who came after him. This is off the top of my head. Um, Walter Marshall uh, wrote a book called, what's his book on sanctification? Walter Marshall... Oh, now I've lost my train. That's what I get for veering from my notes. <laughs> a, a helpful book on sanctification as a Christian and living in light of these things. But Walter Marshall is responding to Baxter as well, defending the doctrine. There are others who do this as well. And I'll keep this one short because we're going to do Romans 8. Gospel mystery. Gospel mystery of sanctification. Thank you. Gospel mystery of sanctification is super helpful when it comes to, none of this is saying you should live however you want to live. But don't be a Baxterian, okay? Listen to John Owen, don't be Baxterian. And then Marshall was ravaged and plagued by all of this, you must believe in Jesus and do enough to get finally justified. And so he responds in a very helpful kind of Puritan book, um, helping people to, to get away from Baxter kind of stuff. And by the way, Rome teaches it a little bit different, just for clarity, initial justification at baptism, okay? based upon the belief of the parents. And then if you do enough, eventually, perhaps, maybe, after purgatory too, you'll be finally justified. I think it would be helpful if we understood Catholic theology better, because if we understood Catholic theology better, we would hear N.T. Wright and say, I've heard that before. Or we would be reading Richard Baxter, and we'd say, that, 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 that's Roman Catholicism, even though you're not a Roman Catholic. I think the same thing would be true even today among ourselves. It would be helpful to, to, helpful to read and understand some of the things they've taught before because they were never, ever saying that justification is strictly by works. Ever. Don't misrepresent them. They don't teach that. Re I shouldn't say this, right? R but, but read the Catholic Catechism. They, they go out of their way to teach against that kind of stuff, that it is by grace, through faith in Christ, plus what you do under the Galatian anathema, but they're not saying it strictly works. What I'm trying to suggest to you is it's good to know that. So when Tom Wright or Richard Baxter says, we're not saying it's strictly by works, it's by faith in Christ and our works. Oh, that, that, that's wrong. That's wrong. There's a reason for a Protestant Reformation as well. We will look at Romans 8.1 later, but just for now, therefore, no, that's Romans 5.1. What is Romans 8.1? How does Romans 8.1 start? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's talking about people at the beginning of their Christian experience. There's no condemnation. He's telling them the future is what he's doing. I can tell you what's going to happen in the future when you stand before God if you're a Christian. That's what Paul's saying. I can tell you about final justification. Final justification is actually a present reality. No condemnation because you're of your faith in Christ. So we'll talk about that more in the next section. We could look at Romans 2.13 because they love Romans 2.13. I would just encourage you to say Romans 2.13 should be interpreted in light of Romans 3.10. It's true God justifies the doers, not the hearers. He's busy painting you in a corner so you can say, none righteous, no, not one. But it's amazing how many people take Romans 2.13 and build a whole doctrine of justification, initial by faith and final by works on Romans 2.13. It's not very Protestant. It's not a very good look. But there are people who do it and people who you might even have books by on your shelves. Just be careful. Beware. Okay, let's do this next one. Number 10, justification sola fide does not, does not remain alone. 
Justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, or sola fide does not remain alone. This is Romans 6, right? In Romans chapter 6, you're called to do the right thing. But you're called to do the right thing not because you'll be justified by doing the right thing. You're called to do the right thing because you're united to Christ. And if you're united to Christ, right, you're, you're born again by the Spirit of God, and now do the right thing. Don't behave badly. Christians of all people should act differently. So it's so interesting. He says, what shall we say then? Romans 6.1. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? What's he assume the answer to be? No, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's, it's the logical impossibility. And, and it's what's interesting too. He goes on to say, he goes on to say that, that we're, we're under grace, we're not under law. But then he goes on to use all kinds of law words, all kinds of legal words like obedience. Tons of law words. And so he's not contradicting himself. He's saying, we're not, if you keep reading in Romans 6, we won't do it now. We're not under law, we're under grace. Read into that in light of the context. We're not under law for justification. We're under grace. But then he goes on to talk about how you should obey the law. All kinds of legal words. And it's not a contradiction, you see, but we as Christians are not justified by our works. We're not under the law for our justification. Jesus did that. And now that we're Christians, united to Christ by faith, not under law for our justification, we should follow the law. But we follow the law with boldness. We follow the law with security. We follow the law without fear. It's grand. It's wonderful. Because we're in a different relationship with God. We want to obey. Absolutely, we want to obey. Number 11, next distinctive, we're doing 12 of these, would be justification before God and justification before humanity are distinct. Justification before God and justification before humanity are distinct. Won't take too much time on this because we should get this going, but I, th I think this is what's happening in James chapter 2. I know my Roman Catholic friend, let's call him Chris because that's his name, Let's call his wife Mary because that's her name. <laughs> I, I know what they're taught by their church, and that is that justification is initially by baptism and or faith, and finally it's by works based upon Romans chapter 2 and James chapter 2. And I want to say let's study James, which really happened. James chapter 2, you see then, this is verse 24, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. <laughs> When's the next mass? I'm going to convert. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's not contradicting himself or he's not contradicting the apostle Paul or Jesus for that matter. He's saying something that's true, but let's read it in context. That's 224. 218 says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Something different is happening. He, he's talking about on a, on a horizontal level versus a vertical level. Uh, in the court of public opinion, I like to say, justification is by works. In the court of God Almighty, justification is based upon the works of another, and it's by faith alone to you as a sinner who's trusting in Christ. He's talking about two different things. I'm not afraid of James chapter 2 at all. It's absolutely true. And you say, how can I know if you're a Christian, Pat? Well, I'm not perfect. Uh, first of all, I want you to know I'm believing in Jesus, but I have been united to him by faith, and um, the Spirit of God has regenerated me and is bearing fruit in my life. And, and, and you know what? I, I don't do all the things I want to do, but I don't do all the things I used to do. And you can see fruit in my life. I'll show you my faith by my works. And then you can... Declare me righteous or not, right? So I see it. You show, I show. It's not talking about this. Two different things. Two different things. I think R.C. Sproul actually does a really nice job with that very thing. Contra people like Tom Schreiner and others who sound an awful like, lot like they're Roman Catholic. Next, we'll do this as the final one. Number 12, justification solo fide. Lots of Latin here. I... I I don't know Latin, but I've got a really good Latin dictionary. And I like R.C. Sproul. <laughs> Justification sola fide brings soli deo gloria. 
to God alone be the glory. Justification, sola fide, brings sola, uh, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. I referenced it in the last session, but I'll just quote it now. Worthy is the Lamb. Can we read into that in context? And only the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Christianity is not a we did it religion. Ah, I got in with initial justification based upon what Jesus did. And then I got in with final justification based upon what I did. We did it. No, may it never be. Soli de o gloria. To God alone be the glory. It's a great litmus of whether or not we're talking about the God who justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify the godly. I know this stuff is super basic, but I'm committed in my life to knowing and understanding the super basic better because it's the super basic stuff that ends up being the profound stuff. Uh, John Wooden, right? The famous basketball player for UCLA. How many championships? I don't remember, maybe 10. What's your secret, Dr. Wooden? How do you do all this kind of stuff? I teach my players to master the fundamentals. Die hard fundamentals guy. If we can own some of these basic things and grow in our knowledge of the grace of God and Christ Jesus, things like God justifies the ungodly, by the grace of God, the world can change, right? We, we, we can rightly represent the king and be good ambassadors, not perfect ones, but better ones. And we can live for his honor and for his glory out of gratitude and the world could be a different place. So I hope these things stoke the fire. Uh, Romans 8 is uh, what we're going to do next and, and it's staggeringly good. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles in the next session to the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. Guess what it's going to be? It's going to be Romans chapter 8. So I wanted you to all pass the next quiz. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but people have often said that it's the greatest, and I'm just going to go with it, and that's what we'll do in the next session. I should pray, though. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the fact that you are the God who justifies the ungodly. Help us to not be confused by this. Help us to learn from others, but most importantly, help us to learn by the power of the Spirit from your word. Encourage us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody.